Today's daf we're going to be learning is Ketubo Daf Yubet. Today's daf is sponsored by Judith Weil in loving memory of Hadina, Adina Hashej's beloved mother-in-law, Keti Kamuna Peretz Hashej, who passed away yesterday on the 18th of Tammuz. May Adina and Eric know, know no more sorrow. Um, okay, we're going to, a few quick announcements. Number one, the bookmark orders are open. You have till Wednesday to order your bookmarks, so get in your orders quickly. If you didn't yet order our Nashim bookmarks, those who already ordered your Yavamot, it's the same thing. You don't need to order again. But if you're new to the DAF, you haven't yet ordered, uh, please order. They're free and we'll send them to you. Uh, second thing, I want to just remind you that I'll be, um, the DAF will continue as normal over the summer, but not on Zoom. Okay, starting next Sunday already, there will not be Zoom for about a month till around the 25th of August. So stay tuned on the Zoom WhatsApp group. If you're not on it, you can uh, go to our website to find out how to join. And uh, and that's that. Okay. So if we're going to start. We have a great, really, another one of these interesting dapim. These are the reasons why this stuff is considered chas katan, because we're going to see all sorts of interesting issues that come up, <clears throat> particularly toward the end of the daf. very, very basic suviot about how we determine different contradictory claims. One person says what? One person says something else. One, uh, one person says one thing. One person says something else. How do we know who to believe? Upon what principles do we operate? Um, and that's going to be, that's going to kind of be the intro to a whole bunch of Mishnayot that are talking about different claims that are made and how we resolve, you know, who's telling the truth and who's not. Actually, will take us for a while. This uh, this topic, really, really fascinating. Okay. Tanu Rabana, we're going to start from the beginning of Yud Aleph Amabet at the bottom. Quoting a Braita, if you remember, let's just go back to the Mishnah for a minute. The Mishnah at the bottom of Yud Aleph Amabet Aleph said, um, if you have a Almana Grusha Bechalutzam and Nisuin, you have a woman who was married but never had relations, she's still a virgin. Ktubatan Manef, their Ktuba is worth only 100, even though they're virgins, but they were already married. So this is a and ain't lahem tana betuli, and the husband can't go claim. Well, I thought she was a betula, and therefore, therefore what? I mean, a non betula gets a hundred. Well, in this case, he wants to claim she lied to me. She's really not a virgin, and theoretically, he would want to say mekach taud. I married her thinking she was one thing. Turns out she wasn't, and I don't want to give her anything. But he can't do that. Why can't he do that? Because it's something that he should have known that it was a possibility anyway. Okay. In the normal case, you don't really think about it. You know, she says, I'm a petula. You figure she's telling the truth. But in a case where she was already married to someone, even though she claims she's a petula, seems like there's at least a good, ch- you know, a possible chance that she's not. So therefore, you should have known going in, and therefore you can't claim, oh, she duped me. Because, you know, if you're duped by someone who duped you in a way that you should have really considered all the possibilities, and you didn't, that's not considered um, being duped by her. So now, we're going to have a case where all the more so you would think, Maybe he could claim he was duped, and yet he can't. Tano Rabbanan. Knasal Rishon L'Shum Nisuin. The first husband married her, right, for purposes of marriage. He brings her into his house. The Yeshla Edim Shalon But there's witnesses. Here we have something further, which is, not only were they married, and she claimed she was a virgin, but there are witnesses that they were never alone in a room together from the time of the marriage till the time of the divorce or his death or something like that. Inami, or alternatively, nistira velo shahata kedebiya. They were in a room alone, but not enough to have had relations. Ein hashini acholit on ta'anat betuli. Still, the second husband can't claim, even though it seems like there's proof that they couldn't have been together and that she was a virgin, he still can't claim it. Sharei knasari sham, because she was actually married. So it's not a claim that we're going to allow you to make. To which Rabbah says, from here one can infer the following. From here you can infer. Forget about an almana, you know, a widow. She was previously married. A regular person. A guy marries a woman. She was never married. She says, I'm a virgin. He, he finds out she's not. What happens? Instead of the 200 zoos, she drops down to 100. Now, theoretically, you could have thought he could claim you lied to me. I don't want to be married to you at all, and, and you don't even get your hundred zoos. You get nothing because you lied to me. So from here, you can infer that's not the case. She still gets her ketubah of a hundred zoos, her non-betula ketubah, right? She doesn't get 
her 200 zoos, but she does get 100 zoos. How do you infer it from here? Because look, our Brita right now just said if he thought she was a virgin, and it turns out she wasn't, she still gets the basic, you know, non-virgin ketubah. So we're comparing the cases. It seems pretty similar. No, it's not exactly similar because we already just said here she was actually married and it even says Sharei Knasari Shon. And maybe that's the reason. But right now they're saying, but if you look at it, <clears throat> it looks like there's witnesses that she wasn't, she didn't have relations with him, which basically means she's kind of like an unmarried woman who claimed she was a virgin and turned out not to be. So that's what Rab- Rabba wants to learn from here. Rabba Ashi Ama, Ba'alma la'kla. No. In a regular case, she doesn't get anything because she really did lie to him. In this case, this case is different. Why? Shanehacha, exactly for the reason we said. Sharek nasari show. If he just marries a random woman who was never married before, and she claims she was a virgin, and it turns out she wasn't, so he had no way of anticipating that she was lying. In this case, since she was already married, he should have anticipated that it's possible she's really not a virgin. Right? There's already something that indicates that way, even though... There were witnesses saying no, but still she was married. It somehow puts it in a different context. And that's where Vashi says you can't compare the cases and therefore you can't derive from this. Really, if, and this is, right, this is something we saw wasn't very clear in the Mishnah before. What does it mean, yesh lotana patulim? Does it mean he could drop her down to 100? Or does it mean she doesn't get anything because she lied to him, right? And this is something that you can see is not so clear. Rabbah thinks she gets 100. Rabbah, she thinks she gets nothing. Ama, um, now the Gemara asks, Why do we say, right, why are we worried that maybe he has to divorce her and maybe she was with some other man? In other words, right here, we have witnesses she wasn't with the first husband, which means either she was with someone before the first marriage or maybe she was with someone while she was engaged to him. Maybe she, we should be concerned for that possibility. What we mean is in a case where he betrothed her and married her immediately. Already, this is a, a bit of a, a hinting, an allusion to the next Mishnah, where we're going to see that even though we talked about there was Kiddushin, and a year later there was marriage in most cases, there were clearly different customs, and sometimes people married the women right away. First of all, in general, for a second marriage, it was a shorter Eirusin time period. Could be here, he did the Kiddushin and, and the marriage right away, in which case there was no chance that while she was betrothed to him, this happened. Okay? That's what Rav Shrevia says. This whole thing from the beginning of this page, from Amar Rabbah until Rav Shrevia, was all said on the Brayta, but some people have this version. There was actually a comment on our mission. So, um, there were some who said it about our Mishnah. So some people say this was this whole discussion happened on our Mishnah. When our Mishnah said, remember what the difference between our Mishnah and the brightest. The brightest said, even if there were witnesses that said she wasn't with him. Our Mishnah just talked about a woman who was married and claimed she actually never had a relation with her husband. It's just based on her claim. There's no witnesses. So in our Mishnah, it says, right, a bitula, a woman who's a virgin, but is an almanah, grusha, or chalutza, minanisu, and she was already married. Ketubatan maneh, she gets a hundred. Ve'en lem tana and the husband can't claim Oh, you said you were a virgin, and I'm not giving you anything. What could this be? That's the way we explained it. She had a chuppah, but she never ended up having relations with him. Here comes in Rabba. We're going to have the exact same sugya, but it's going to be on this. This seems to teach you. Now here it's a little more comparable. Right? She claims she was a virgin. He says, right, he finds out she wasn't. So she drops down to a mane. Okay, because that's what happened here. No, he says, in general, she doesn't get anything. In this case, it really was very different because she went to the chuppah. Here we didn't even have witnesses that said, right, we had nothing. Okay, so... Actually, it's less comparable. I made a mistake before. It's less comparable because in that case, at least she had witnesses. Well, the truth is in the Betula case, it was really her word against his. This is also her word against his, except, so maybe it's a little more similar, but basically, it doesn't matter. They're all really pretty much the same. 
But here, the main difference is she already was married to him, right? She lived with him, and, and in this case, specifically, we don't have witnesses at all, so he really should have anticipated that there was a chance, and therefore he can't start claiming, you made me believe this, when she, she should have really thought about the possibility. Maybe we should be concerned she, she claimed, now when did she make the claim that I'm a betula before she was engaged, right? She said, I'm a betula, and that's, you know, and then in the end, she only got 100 anyway for Uktuba, but she claimed that. Maybe, though, Shema Tachtav Zinta, maybe the Be'ila that she did, maybe she slept with someone after the engagement, which means that she'd be forbidden to him. Amrav Shrevia, Kigon Shkideshu So that exact same discussion, right? It must be that he betrothed her and slept with her right away. Uman Demane La Abraita, Koshakena Matniti. Now they say the following. The person who learned this whole sugya on the Braita would all the more so say it was true for the Mishnah. Because again, in which case, okay, we're really focusing on Ravashi. Ravashi distinguishes and says he should have anticipated that maybe she had been with someone, right? And therefore the cases are incomparable. Now, where is it more likely? In our Mishnah, right? So if he says it, even in the Brighta, when there's witnesses that said she wasn't with him, he still should have anticipated, then all the more so in the Mishnah, he'll say the same thing. When there weren't witnesses that said she wasn't with him, she was even alone in a room with him for a long time, or who knows, could be something had happened, all the more so he should have anticipated. And in which case, he really can't claim Tanah Petuli. But, and therefore, it's not comparable to a different case. But if you said it on the matnitin, but if this whole discussion happened on the Mishnah, and particularly Rav Ashi, who says we distinguish between the cases, it's not like a regular woman who just claims I'm a betula, because then he really thought he should believe her. If that whole discussion was said on our Mishnah, then when it comes to the case in the Brayta, where there were witnesses who said she was not alone in a room, he could claim maybe Ta'anat Betulim and claim you get nothing because you lied to me because I relied on the witnesses. You have witnesses to support your claim and I relied on them and therefore I really was duped. Okay, in which case, possibly then in, in that case, right, they would think that it's, that you wouldn't say, Rabbi Ashi wouldn't be able to make that claim. Basically, you would end up saying what Rabbi tried to say, which is, you really could learn from here she gets a ketubah of Amaneh because of in the bright it says she gets a hundred even though she clearly lied to him and duped him. Therefore, in a regular case of being duped, maybe also she would get a Amaneh and Rabashi would be able to claim, no, in a regular case you get nothing. Okay, so it depends which one you learn it on. You could come to different conclusions. Now we get to this, which I promise we deal with more in depth and uh, about this issue of the Minhag in Yehuda. We're going to learn some very interesting things about the Minhag in Yehuda. If your Hebrew is good, I strongly recommend reading from Mishnat Eretz Yisrael. He has a very long um, article on this or, or commentary on this. His commentary is on the Mishnah. If you have Safaria, you can look it up on the Mishnah and in commentaries on the Mishnah. Just find our Mishnah in the first chapter. I don't remember what number of Mishnah it is, but it's not too hard to find. And then you can uh, read up about this. And Shuli Mishkin had an article about it as well that went up today um, about this Minhag in Yehuda and... Uh, and very, very, very interesting. So, ha'ochel etza chamid biyuda, and I'll, I'll summarize some of the things that Safrai said, and you can read also, if it was not good, you can read in flashback also, which summarizes um, some of the points. So, ha'ochel etza chamid biyuda shelo be'edim. Someone who eats at their father-in-law's house in Judea, you have to remember, there were two main areas, Judea and Galil, okay? In the Galilee, in the time the Mishnah was put together, most of the rabbis were in the Galilee area. So you have to remember that when they talk about this Minhag in Yehuda, they're talking about it from a distance, and you can imagine that they didn't exactly approve of the Minhag in Yehuda. Okay, so let's read and then we'll talk about it. So if somebody eats with their father-in-law in Judea, Shaloba Edi, meaning he comes to the father-in-law's house, he eats there, and now what does it mean he eats without witnesses? It means he eats there and then ended up in a room alone with his fiance without witnesses, he no longer has a right to claim when he actually marries her that she wasn't a virgin, because he was alone with her in a room, and therefore, who knows what happened there. It could be they have relations. 
So we're starting to learn here that basically, first of all, how Chelet Tzachamib is a whole discussion in the commentaries. Is this that there was a big Sudade we've seen where he would come to the house and eat this big festive meal like an engagement party? And that's what we're talking about. That night they would have Yichud. Or is this common that during the time that they were betrothed, he would often come there and it's not talking about a particular meal. It's just kind of discussing if he were to have done this, you know, and this was common in those days in Judea, people would do this, right? Then already he has no rights to claim Tanah Betulim because he already could have been alone because he was alone in a room with her. Something could have transpired. So now they say, because it says one who eats at his father-in-law's house in Judea, from here you can infer, you can already see the agenda of the Gemara. They want to tell you, don't think everybody was doing this. You can infer from the Mishnah that it was only those who did this. Because it says one who eats by his father, he won't have a ton of opportunity. But it's not everybody, not everybody in Judea did that. Because okay, they kind of want to say, right? We don't exactly approve of this custom and we don't know why people are doing this. So, you know, they're saying, just know it wasn't to everybody. And Amar Abai, Abai also says, Shema minab Yehuda, nami mekamot mekamot yesh. It was clear there were different customs in Judea. As it says in the following Brayta, which is actually a Tosefta, Kedetanya, as it says, Amar Rabbi Yehuda. Okay, I just want to point out that Safrai claims that this Brayta was written in the Galil and it's kind of, pointing a finger, like saying, we don't do this kind of thing, okay? Kind of saying, this is what goes on there, but no way would this happen by us. So, be you, and you'll see it from the language. In Yehuda, in the beginning, originally, they would bring them together in a room alone. One hour before they went into the chuppah, now there's just a short time before, because they wanted him to, they wanted her to be beloved to him. They wanted to develop the relationship, right? If you think of the Shidduch world, right, where a couple meets once or twice, barely knows each other, goes to the chuppah, you know, they don't know. They wanted, before the chuppah, for them to have a certain familiarity with each other. But in the Galil, no, they wouldn't do this, okay? Here you have the Galilean saying, no way, no how. So, first of all, this Libo Gaspa comes up in the Yerushalmi in a bit of a different context. In the Yerushalmi, it was discussed as if it was a, it, there was a Shat Hashmad. Okay, there was a time where there was something going on with the enemy. Okay, so there's, it appears there about this Hegemon, that there was a ruler who would sleep with the women. We saw this before, right? He would sleep with the women on the night of their wedding. So, possibly they wanted them to do Yichu before so that it was at least a possibility that maybe she wasn't a Betula anymore and maybe he wouldn't want to do this. Okay, but then he claims it's a little problematic because Safrai claims that that even after the Shema, they still continued this custom, you know, which is interesting. Often things develop and then the reason is no longer there, but yet the custom continues. So that's just interesting in and of itself, whether that's the reason or whether they wanted to just increase the loving relationship between the two. It's not exactly clear. There seem to be different reasons given for it. So now, um, so that's one Barishona originally. Then they say, here's another, and what they're talking about is all these customs that used to exist in Yehuda, and we're going to see from them, a bias point is that not everybody did Yichu before the wedding. Because remember, once you do Yichu before the wedding, you can no longer claim Ta'ana Petulim. The next two cases are clearly based on that in Yehuda, they did claim Ta'ana Petulim. Okay, so, B'Yehuda Barishona, Yuma Midim Lahem Shnei Shushbinim. They would put two ushers, Echad Lo Echad La. They each had an usher. Okay, listen to this. Okay, if you think about um, when you go to the airport, right, and they do a search and they, you know, kind of, they, you know, uh, touch your body to kind of figure out that you're not hiding anything. So listen to this. They would basically do a body search before they went into the chuppah. Okay? They wouldn't do this in the Galil. Okay, now first of all, what are they saying? They didn't trust the people in Yehuda. There were a lot of cheaters. In the Galil, we don't need this. But in Yehuda, they would do, they would make sure that she's not bringing a sheet with her that has blood stains on it that she's going to pull out later and say, oh, look, this is, you know, proof of my betulim. Or that he's hiding something up his sleeve as well. You know, like we just, they weren't sure and they gave them these two ushers to check them body search before they went into the chuppah. Biudah, third custom, Barishona, Yushushbanim Yeshenim, Babay, Chakatama, Kalai Yeshenim, they would sleep in the same house. 
And what would they do? It seems like they would go into the room immediately after to check before anyone has a chance to pull out a sheet that was a fake, you know, and, and say, oh, here's the sheet. This was a betulim and hide the other one. Or, you know, they make sure they check it. Can you imagine, right? Someone coming into your room at the end. Are you done? Okay, you know, let's, let's check what's going on. A little bit strange, but clearly there were cheaters there. Now, what do you see here? What you see here is that there was Tatnat Betulim because these were instituted to prevent someone from lying when they claimed there was no blood or there was, you know, whatever it was. So now you see here that in Yehuda there were different customs. Okay, not everybody in Yehuda did that, and this Tosefta is brought to prove it. Anyone who didn't do like this, can't claim Betulim. That line is a little bit strange, so we're going to have to figure out what this is. Ahaya. To what is this line referring? This last line. Ilem Aresha, if you want to say it's the beginning, that they would be miyachayed in right chatan v'kala. And if, now what should it say? If you did like this, then you would be able to claim betulim, right? So koshen nahag mebayah, it should say, if you did this custom, you wouldn't be able to. But what does it say? Koshen lo nahag, if you didn't do like this, then you couldn't claim betulim. What do you mean? If you weren't miyachayed, you could claim betulim. So that doesn't make sense. Ela asefa, well, if you want to say it's on the second part, then it shouldn't say kol shalom nahag. What should it have said? Right? What's the sefa? They're talking about the second case that they would do this body search. So what they say? Ela sefa kol shalom mushmash mebayle. Anyone who didn't do this body search, it should have said not kol shalom nahag. Anyone who wasn't checked, basically, it should have said. Amar abaye. So it doesn't make sense in either place. So abaye's first. It's the first answer. Lo alam aresha utsnei kol shalom Change the language, the Brighta should say, the Tosefta should say at the end, anyone who did. Okay? Unahag. Amalei Rava, Vaha Koshalo Nahag Katani, but you're changing the wording entirely. You're doing a, a total switch. How could you say Kosha Nahag, Lo Nahag means Kosha Nahag? It's the opposite. It doesn't make sense. El Amarava Hakikama, Koshalo Nahag Minhag Galil Bagalil, El Minhag Yehuda Bagalil, Eno Yacholit on Tanat Betulim. Anyone who didn't do the custom of the Galil and the Galil, and yet did the custom of Yehuda and the Galil, and that makes it a very interesting statement, because what it's saying is, again, imagine that the rabbis are in the Galil when they're writing this. What do they say? If you think that when you live in the Galil, you can do the Minhag of Yehuda, well, you're messing yourself up, because in the end, you won't be able to claim Tanah Petulim, so better not to do the custom of the Yehuda, because you're going to basically prevent yourself from being able to have a claim of betulim once you're married. Rav Ashi Amar La'olam Asefa, third answer, it's really referring to the last line, Utsne, and change it to Koshalom Mushmash, instead of Koshalom Nahag, Koshalom Mushmash, and that actually makes a lot more sense. That's actually a pretty good answer, because it really isn't the biggest difference whether you say Koshalom Nahag or Koshalom Mushmash. Anyone who wasn't checked can't come and claim again, because these people were suspected of being liars and cheaters. Okay. Before we move on, I want to kind of take one point that I took out of reading Safrai, which is that what he claims, and he quotes some sources that show a third custom, is that these different customs, right, we look at this and the Gemara looks at it and says, Mapitom, how can you do this, right? What's our Birchot Eirusim? Asher Asar Lanu Eta Aruso, right? The, the women who are betrothed are forbidden to the husband. So how could they possibly have had Yichud together and, and presumably slept together, right? It's totally forbidden. So there, what he claims is that it's very possible that the halacha that we know to be, that's mentioned in the Gemara and even the Nusach of the Berchad Eirusin, wasn't agreed upon everybody, okay? Well, our Torah that we have is really more the Galilean Torah because our Mishnah is put together from the Glilim, right, from the people in the Galilee, and therefore that's what was passed down. But what he claims from these earlier sources that talk about this custom in Yehuda. And he also points out this custom in Alexandria, in Egypt, that there were three different customs, and they were based on different halachic viewpoints about how they view Erusim. So starting with Alexandria, he says that based on certain sources you can see, they didn't view Erusim as marriage. We always talk about Erusim is betrothal, it's halachic marriage to a certain extent, not marriage, but betrothal to the extent that you need a get, right? You need a get, you're basically already married enough to, to, to require a divorce. So that's one extreme. In Alexandria, he claims that they didn't view Erusin as that. They viewed Erusin like we view Erusin. Okay, we're making a commitment to each other, but 
we don't need a divorce from it. But they have one custom, which is they didn't view Erosin at all as anything. Then we have the Galileans who viewed it as, as a betrothal, but it forbids, right? It's not enough yet. It's a partial betrothal that you're betrothed, but you can't be together with your husband. And what he claims is, again, it's, it's his theory that, and he, tried, he brings supports for it, and you can, you can see them inside, but he claims that in Yehuda, they believed that Averson actually did permit you, okay? That you were actually permitted to be together. It wasn't forbidden. Averson was more than what it was in, in, the Gal- in the Galilee. And therefore, because of that perspective, so they had no problem having them be mityached together. Right? Their version of Berchad Eresim would not have looked like our version. It wouldn't say, Asar lanu atahusa. So it's not that they were doing something that was forbidden. It was just that they were they had a different approach to how we view Eresim. Right? Think about it. If Eresim requires divorce, then you're obviously somewhat married, right? what we call married. So the question is just how much. Right? And then and then what's the difference is a good question. And what's the difference between marriage and betrothal according to that? So it does have some questions against it, but it does explain it a little bit better. But again, the Gal- the ones in the Galil, you can see were disparaging to them and couldn't understand it. And kind of, you know, even this whole thing that they, they had Shushbanin, you know, the question is, is that absolute truth? Or are they saying, well, these people, you know, were bad because they did this and they were Rama'im and they weren't believed and, and all that. And it's almost a way of them pushing aside the people in Yudan and putting them down because they wanted people not to take seriously what they did and do it by them because their halachic viewpoint was very different. They viewed Erusin as marriage and if, as a just betrothal and forbidden to. And if you let them sleep together, wow, that's really bad. So, you know, and then you have these sources that kind of put them, push them to the side and say, oh, you know, well, don't be like them. It's interesting, right? And the question is also, was it a very early custom, right? This seems to say it was a very early custom and it could be, wasn't even any more in practice. And then also, it's not exactly clear what the practice was because you have people discussing it who are no longer living in that time. So anyway, there's a lot of interesting things there. Like I said, it's a very long article and uh, worth reading and, and Shuli's also um, gives some other insights. Okay, new Mishnah. Another strange custom. Okay, whether you're an Almana of Israel or of a, of a Yisrael or you're an Almana, okay, it's unclear when they say Kohanim here, does it mean you're a widow from a Kohen? Or more likely, you're a widow who is a Bat Kohen. You come from a Kohen's family, Ketuba Mane, okay, no matter what, you're going to get a Ketuba of a Mane. It doesn't matter your status. But Beitin Shal Kohanim, how you go vin le betula arba This is a very interesting thing, and it's clearly not 100% clear where this applied. To who it applied, we'll see in the Gabara different options, really. But there was a baiting of Kohanim. Safrai claims this is a baiting of Tztukim. Right? We saw the, the Sadducees, um, that they had their own court system. And they come up a bunch, the baiting Shal Kohanim and the Mishnah. Not, it's not exactly clear what this baiting Shal Kohanim is, but they would, they basically ruled for the Kohanim. So now it seems like, although it could be even more, we'll see in the Gemara, but they're talking about a Bat Kohen. Because she has a certain status in society, she would get double the ketuba. She would be promised 400 zuz in her ketuba. The courts would insist. The rabbis didn't go against them. It's interesting because if they are stukim, like Safari claims, right, often the rabbis went out against the stukim because the rabbis were often prushim, the Pharisees. So it's interesting here to see on this issue, they didn't make an issue about it. Tana. Now, Breita says, Almanat koanim ketuba tamatayim. It says the Almana of a Kohen gets Matayim. The Hanan Tanam, but our Mishnah says, Acharamana Yisrael, Acharamana Kohen, Ketubah Tamane, she only gets 100. So, why is this? Amrav, how do you resolve this contradiction? Amravashi, again bringing history into the picture, Shtei Takanotayim. There were two, there were different stages to what happened. Meika and the, the Brights and the Mishnah each reflect different stages. Meika at Kinu Libetula Arba Meotsus. In the beginning, they said Betula gets 400. If you're assuming we're talking about a Bat Kohen, again, it's not 100% clear. But if you're a daughter of a Kohen, you get 400 zoos. Ula Almana Mane, but a widow gets 100 like any widow. We don't distinguish. What was the problem? Turning now to Amubet. Kevan de Chazu de Mizalzalebu. But then we saw that people started treating the Almanot of Kohenim, the Bat Kohen Almana, not very seriously, right? They were like, oh, well, she's an Almana. We're not interested in marrying her, right? She's no different than any almana, so why would we marry her over anyone else? 
and to Kino Lehuma time. So because of that, they started giving her a ketubah of 200 sous. You can see here that what clearly is going on is these are status issues in society. Okay, as much as we like to believe, right, everyone should be treated equally in those days, right, just like we have issues with this issue of a virgin is in a higher place in society than a non-virgin, right, in terms of her marriageability, right, and which doesn't sit well with us, but it was definitely a prevalent custom in those days, not just among Jews, but among many of the other nations. That was just kind of the, you know, this is what makes a better bride as a virgin. Then also, right, Kohanim, the Kohen family, just like in those days, right? Nowadays, it's much harder to, to be what we're supposed to respect Kohanim more than we respect any other person. Right? It's a strange concept for us to get around. But in those days, yes, that's the way it was. Society was, this is the higher echelon of society. And if their widows were treated the same as everyone else, that wasn't a good thing. So therefore, it's Kinuluma time. So they gave them 200, so they would be treated nicely. They get more money. But what's the problem? Well, if you're going to marry a woman who's already been married, and you have your choice of a bat kohen, who's you have to pay two hundred for a ktuba, and a regular woman who you only have to pay a hundred. You're going to choose, right? They're going to say, "Kevan de chazu de kaparshim inayu." People stop marrying them. Damar ad nesibat almanat kohenim. If I'm going to marry an almana and have to pay two hundred zuz, well, I may as well what? May as well use a betula by Israel. I may as well marry a virgin who's not a bat kohen, but at least she's a virgin, right? In other words, when you so yes, benot kohen are higher up, but when it comes to a virgin, is higher up than that. So basically, we're going to end up right. The men ended up saying, "Well, if I'm already going to spend two hundred on the ketubah, I may as well get a virgin for that price." Again, this is again comparing it, which we're going to see later more comparisons of this to a purchase, right? Even though it's not a purchase, but the gemara does speak about it in the language of a purchase. Okay, so. May as well, for that price, better off getting a virgin. And therefore, Adrinu the Miltai, they put her back down to 100 zoos, right? You would have thought they would do 150, right? Let's do something in the middle. But I guess it was there, you know, they had the 200, the 100. They didn't start getting creative enough to say, let's give her 150. But basically, they said, for her own sake, to protect her so that she's able to get remarried, they put it down to 100. Beijing Shalkani. So now we're going to this concept of this Beit Shin Shalkonim, the Institute of 400 Zeus, for the Benot Kohen. Amar Rav Yehud Amar Shmuel, Lo Beit Shin Shalkonim Bilvadabu. By the way, this wasn't just Kohanim, and if you didn't believe me that this is a status issue, here it becomes very clear. El Afilu Mishpachot HaMiyuchasopi Yisrael, right, the, the ones who have the best Yichus, right, the ones who can trace their lineage back as far as possible, and the ones who have no issues of any mamzerim in their family, any slaves in their family, any anything, Ones who have the best yichus im ratzula so kederach shakohanim osim osim. It's also number one an issue of showing this is all a status issue, and number two I think was a way of the miuchasim saying we're just as good as the kohanim, and we're going to give our daughters right insist that they get a higher ketubah as well, right? This is all using money as a status symbol. So now they say, wait a minute, meitive question on Shmuel. Um, the Brita says, If you want to do like the Kohanim, Kigon, like for example, a Bat Yisrael le Kohen, or a Bat Kohen le Yisrael. Okay, now, some people think, by the way, that this 400 Zuz was instituted for a Kohen with a Bat Yisrael, that that's like the best marriage ever. You know, you keep, and that it was a way, Safrai talks about this, quotes an opinion in the Yerushalmi, it was a way of keeping out. Okay, talk about apropos Parashat Shavua with Benot Slavchad, okay, either last week or this week, depending on where you are. But Benot Slavchad, right, where they said you have to marry within your Shevet, right? If you want to get the lamb, but you have to stay within the tribe. That this is a way of making sure that Kohanim married Kohanim because they made the Ketuba so high that nobody would want to marry about Kohen. Okay, that's also another way of looking at it. It's a different perspective. Instead of saying, right, it's a way to keep Kohanim marrying Kohanim. Okay, how they had the money to afford it is a good question. Uh, but it was a way of kind of discouraging other people from marrying these Benot Kohen. So now they say, so, and this source will kind of support that, because what are the Kohanim, Mosim Kohanim, or Kohanim with Kohanim? Now, if you want to be like a Bat Yisrael a Kohen, or a Bat Kohen Yisrael, if it's a mixed marriage, and you want to do this 400 Zuz, you can. So what do you see from here? Who can do it? A Yisrael who marries a daughter of a Kohen, or a Kohen who marries a daughter of a Yisrael. But what is it mentioned here? Yisrael and Yisrael. So how could Shmuel say, if you're a Mishpacha Miyucheset, 
and you want to marry for 400 years, you can do it. It says here, right? It's only if you have some element of kihuna. But about Israel to Israel can't do this. Now, it seems strange. What, you can't just add money to your ketuba, right? It's a good question what they mean. I see someone was writing in the chat about Tosefet Ketuba. So, Tosefet Ketuba, I think, is something else. In other words, I think that this is the main sum of the Ketuba you want to put is the 400 zoos. You can always add more, but that's added. That's something different. That's not the main sum. So, I think what they're saying here is you can't make the main sum 400. You could do 200 zoos and then add 200 zoos. That's fine. But it's not like saying she's a Ketuba 400, right? That's different. Again, it's hard to understand exactly without really understanding the significance of what that number, you know, why that was. Um, okay. So now they say, it sounds like it doesn't include Israel and Israel. So how did they allow it? So they say, oh no, you misunderstood this source. It's a lo, lo, lo mibay, uh, sorry, lo mibaya kama. It's the structure of a lo mibaya, which means what? Lo mibaya by Israel, Israel, de lo matse armalai luye kama alina lach. We didn't even need to mention Israel to Israel. Of course, now we go back to saying not what I just said a minute ago, and this actually makes more sense. Of course you could give a ketubah 400. Anyone can give a ketubah 400. And so that case doesn't even need to be mentioned because he can't claim. Now, you, you won't understand this so well now. You'll understand it when we get to the next line, when we say what you can do in a different case. You can't claim, lo say amr you can't say to her, I'm raising you up in society and therefore, I don't need to give you a higher ketubah. He can't say that to her because he's in the same status as she is. They're both Yisraeli. Ava by Yisrael a Kohen. But the daughter of Yisrael marrying a Kohen, the Kohen could say to her, I don't need to give you the 400 zoos because what? Demat Armalai could say to her, Iluya kamalina lach. I'm already raising you up because I'm allowing you to marry me and I'm a Kohen, right? This is a very arrogant kind of thing to say. But I'm already bringing you up to the status of marrying a coin, and therefore you can't try to tell me I have to give you a hike too, but like be happy that I'm already giving you status. I don't need to also promise you 400 zoos, right? Emalo, kamash malan. Here you learn that the court could insist he give her 400 zoos, okay? Even though he's already doing her something good by marrying her, no, they could even insist that he give her the 400 zoos as well because he's a coin and coin, and we're supposed to give more money. Again, it's not 100% clear for this whole thing why they're giving them more money, how this custom developed, what the purpose is. There's a lot of confusion about it. So if you're leaving confused, it's because it's not exactly clear. Was it disincentive so that someone wouldn't marry in from somewhere else? Is it, um, is it to show higher status, right? So either, and then it becomes confusing. I understand that Bakalain who marries Israel should get a higher too because she's coming from a place of status. But why uh, Yisra, about Israel marrying a coin? Why should he have to pay all that money? This, it, right? Or either it's just saying if he wanted to, he could, right? It's it's unclear exactly how this all works. Okay, new Mishnah. Here we get into the the interesting Dine Mamado issues and and believability, right? When we believe a person in court, what what tools do we have to pull out of our arsenal in order to determine whose claim we're going to accept when we have contradictory claims? We're going to have a lot of this going forward for the next number of dapim. He marries a woman, not a virgin. He omered, she claims, Look, when you promised me the 200 zoos when we got engaged, I was a virgin. But what happened? Well, I got raped. Once I was already betrothed to you, which means, Right? Your field just got ruined, okay? It's, it's like you buy a field, and the next day a storm comes and destroys your field. So that's what happened to you, and it's your it's your issue, right? There's nothing we can do about it. He says, No, what are you talking about? Maybe this happened, right? He doesn't know, okay? And that's gonna be an important point, because he doesn't know. This could have happened before we were betrothed. And then I'm gonna claim Mekhtaut. This was a mistake, and I'm not gonna give you a tube of my time, I'm gonna give you a hundred. So Rabban Gamliel and Rabbi Lezer Umrim Ne'emene. They believe her. Rabbi Yoshua Omer, Lo mi pia anu chayim. We don't live off her word. Ela harezo b'chazka be'ula. Where she's considered a be'ula. Ad shelo titares. We're going to assume she was already not a virgin before the engagement. V'hitato. And she tricked him into believing she was. Ad shtevi ra'ya l'dvarer. Until she can bring a proof. What's this based on? 
So we're going to see inside the Gemara, but the first claim, Rabban Gamliel and Rabbi Lezer, why do they believe her? Because they say, or at least we'll see, at least the beginning of it is, she has a definitive claim. He has a suffix claim. He doesn't know. She says, I was raped once I was betrothed. She can claim that because that's her body, right? He has no idea what happened. He claims, well, maybe it was before. So this is what we call Bari Vashema, when you have a clear claim, a Bari claim, or a Shema claim, a possible claim. Bari Vashema, Bari Adif. Bari, Bari always wins out. The definitive claim wins out. Not necessarily always, we'll see, but that's a possibility. Then, Rabbi Yoshua says, until she brings proof, what is this based on? Well, she wants to claim that I get 200 zoos. Where's the money? It's in his hands. So what do we learn always? If you want to take money out of someone else, she wants to claim the 200 zoos is hers, she has to prove it. She doesn't have proof. Unless she can bring proof, then she doesn't get her money, right? The money always stays in the hands. We keep the status quo. So that's his claim. So now the Gemara brings, in order to start comparing and figuring out who holds what and based on what, they bring another case, which is a monetary case. Itmar. Man ali biadcha. Okay? You say, I have money. You have money of mine. Okay? You say to me, so like, I, you gave me money. Let's say you loan me money and I owe you the money. V'hala omer, I say, any o'de, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know. So that's a bari v'shema. Your claim is definitive. I gave you money and you didn't give it back. And I say, I don't know. They say, I have to pay back, because again, Bari Veshema Bari Adif. Rav Nachman, Rav Yochanan Amrei Patur. Why? Because the money is in my hands. Here you see the same kind of machlok. Rav Huna, Rav Yudan Amrei Chayav, Bari Veshema Bari Adif. Definitive claim versus possible, right? Unknown claim. The definitive wins out. Rav Nachman, Rav Yochanan Amrei Patur, okay, Mamon Rebchaz Kamari. We leave the money in the hands of who it's in. It's in my hands. I get to keep it until you can prove otherwise. Amrei Abayi, Rav Yosei. They say the Rav Yehuna and Rav Huna are holding like Shmuel. How do we know? Ditna, they're going to bring Shmuel, who holds like Rabban Gamliel, and they're going to compare it and say, ah, Shmuel holds like Rabban Gamliel, who basically believes the woman with her Bari claim, with her definitive claim. Rav Huna and Rav Yehuda who believe the Bari claim must be holding that. And then we're going to end with, maybe we can distinguish between the cases. But first they bring Rabban Gamliel somewhere else. Okay, the, of a later Mishnah in our in our section. Ditna, Haitama uberet. Okay, the ba- the background you need to know. We learned this in uh, Yevamot. A woman who has relations with a person. There's certain people she can have relations with who disqualify her from marrying a Kohen. She can't marry a Kohen if you've had a rela- you've you have sexual relations with a mom, zera, a netin, a halal, a whole bunch of people. Okay, so right. Remember haba ala this apostles her leidu. We had a whole thing about it in Yevamot. In any case, that's the basis for this. A woman shows up. She shows up pregnant. We don't know who the father is. They said, who's the father? She says it was from this guy and he's a Kohen, which doesn't necessarily mean he's a Kohen. It means he's kasher. Okay? He doesn't mess me up for marrying a Kohen. He was a Yisrael, a Levi, a Kohen. They believe her. And, and Rabbi Yeshua doesn't. Same like our Mishnah. You very smart child, he says to Rav Yudah. They say in the name of Shmuel, the halach is like Rav Gamliel, even in the first one. What's the first one? We're going to have a whole set of Mishnayot, starting with ours. Of these machlokot between Rabbi Lezer and Rabbi uh, Lezer and Rabbi Gamliel against Rabbi Yoshua. So he says, they say in the name of Shmuel, even in the first case, which is our case. Meaning, the Shmuel hold, right? My apurishona, to af agavdi, right? What does it mean, even in our case? Because in our case, it's a little bit different. There, there's no money issue. But in our case, af agavdi ika lememar, okay, mamon abches katmare, even though there's this chazaka that the money is in the hands of the husband, still, amarabban gamliel, bari adif. He rules by bari. Her definitive claim is stronger. So what do you see here? That Shmuel holds like Rabbi Yoshua, uh, sorry, Rav Huna and Rav Yehuda, that they basically hold like Shmuel. That's how we started. To which they say, right, so Lema Rav Yehuda Rav Huna da Amri Karaban Gamliel, Rav Nachav Rav Yachana da Amri Karaban Yoshua. We should line them up. It sounds like they're saying the same thing. We're going to end with Amr Lecha Rav Nachman. Rav Nachman could say, he's not here to say it, but he could say, in other words, the Manali Biyadcha case is not the same as our case. He there said that 
we keep the money in the hands of, right? I claimed, I don't know. I get to keep the money because the money's in my hands. You can't prove it until you prove it. Why? He holds there that we keep the money in the hands and we don't move hands. But he might hold, in our case, even like Rabban Gamliel. Why? There's a Migo claim. Why is there a Migo claim? So two reasons. She claims I was raped, right? Now, first of all, what woman would come forward and say I was raped if she could have claimed I was a Mukat Eitz, right? I'm not a Betula because I got injured, right? That was a much better claim. First of all, who want to get up in front of everybody and say I was raped, right? That's number one. And number two, um, right, if she claims I was a Mukat Eitz after the wedding, after the engagement, I mean, then she would get a tube of 200 zoos. So that's like her best claim, basically. And here she says I was raped, which first of all, disqualifies her to marry a Cohen if she claims she was raped. So like, it's just not a good thing to say if you don't have to say it. So therefore, it's not just that there's Bari, Vashem, Bari, Adif, you also have Amigo. So when you have two things helping you, in that case, even Rav Nachman will agree. In the Manali Biyadcha case, there's only one thing. There's a Bari, Vashem, Bari, Adif, right? Bari, Vashem, but that's it. You don't have anything to add to the Bari Vashema. That's not enough. Just because I'm definitive and you're suffake doesn't mean that my claim is right and yours is wrong. I still could be lying. Inami, second option, is about not comparing these two cases. She's got a cheskap betula. Until we know she's been with someone, a woman is born, you know, until she gets married, we assume she's still a virgin. So she has a cheskap betula. She has a chazaka. That means what her presumptive status is. So it's not just a bari v'shem a bari adif. There's also presumptive status. That doesn't exist here. But when you claim I gave you money and I say, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't have any chazaka. Yes, the money's in my hands, but that's not the same kind of chazaka that we assume presumptive status of anything. So basically, those are two reasons not to necessarily compare these two cases. Okay, but what you see here is that maybe bari v'shem only works when it works together with chazaka. Or according to the first one, only when it works together with Amigo. Okay? And then it wouldn't necessarily be strong enough on its own. So if that's it for today, it's our first kind of entry into all this world of Sveikot and how we deal with it. Um, so anyway, we'll figure this out as we go on. Have a great day, everyone.